Hello again, and welcome to part three of our chapter one recordings. And I just realized that my recordings didn't uh, didn't include any video. <laughs> it just had my uh, my uh, my Zoom profile pic. So sorry about that. And I realized that I was uh, talking about the the molecule of octane at one point, and uh, you weren't able to see it. So uh, so this is what that zigzag when we talked about line drawings. There's that zigzag structure of octane, and that's why I'm representing it uh, as a uh, 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 just as a line drawing, that zigzag line drawing kind of makes sense. Uh, so we'll see if the uh, the video continues. I think the problem is when I suddenly uh, now Zoom doesn't like it when I when I jump and uh, share the content from my iPad. It didn't mind in the past when I did that and continued my video feed. And uh, this time it's it's uh, not not uh, cooperating. So. We'll see if I just lost my video again. Sorry about that. And we'll uh, try and problem sh troubleshoot this as we move on. Um, so what we're talking about next, uh, we're on page five of our skeleton notes. And uh, what I want to talk about is uh, something about uh, atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals, and how we can use those to determine bonding, to describe bonding uh, in organic molecules. So this is in uh, Klein textbook section seven, eight, and nine. So that is the, re the reading that uh, you wanna do to accompany this lecture. So first of all, let's remember what atomic orbitals are. Let's review that. That is a, a mathematical um, um, description of a region uh, where you have a high probability of finding electron density. And uh, the, the mathematical function or the uh, equations are called wave functions. And um, we have things like an S orbital. If you remember what the shape of an S orbital looks like, it's just spherical around the X, Y, and Z axes, right? So it looks something like this. It's, it's spherical. Uh, the P orbitals, however, um, have, uh, have kind of a figure eight shape. And there are three possible um, uh, solutions there to get, to get different p orbitals. You could have a p orbital that is aligned along the y axis. So it has two lobes like this. And we usually shade in one lobe. Doesn't matter which, has, which is shaded and which isn't. What, you're, what we're doing here by showing different colors is we're showing the mathematical sign of those wave functions. And, um, the, uh, and a, every p orbital has um, has a node, and a node is where the um, the sign of the mathematical um, the mathematical sign changes, right? So in passing from this lobe to this lobe, you're changing the sign. So we describe this point as a node, and uh, the that is a place where we were, are not expecting to find any electron density. So that's zero at a node. <clears throat> so this. Uh, we could describe as the PY, so it's oriented along the Y axis. Uh, we could have one along oriented along the X axis, so this would be called the PX. And again, we could shade it in, shade one side or the other, doesn't matter which. And then the Z axis is the one that's coming straight out at you and straight back. So that's the one is at one of these lobes is above the plane, one is behind the plane of the page, <clears throat> and we would call that the PZ. So a a p orbital, anytime we have a p orbital, there's actually two regions of electron density, um, uh, uh, two regions where we expect to find electron density. So electrons can be here or here if, if uh, we had electrons that were in the p x axis. Okay, but we have no electrons uh, here. At the at the origin, that origin is representing where the nucleus of the of the atom is. Okay, so um, so there's one uh, s orbital, and but there's three orientations that you can have for p orbitals, and that's what we what we see uh, when we're looking at that outermost shell. Remember, the valence electrons are what we're going to care about. And remember, another thing that we talked about already was a review reviewing that an s orbital is lower energy than a p orbital. Um, uh, what we're going to find is, is the more nodes that a, a um, particular orbital has, that's, that's going to be something that 
increases the energy, but also we can look at the p orbital and just see that it's more elongated. It's it, those electrons now are, are located further away from the from the nucleus, and that's going to make um, those electrons higher in energy. Okay, so those are the atomic orbitals that we're interested in. We're not going to talk about d orbitals. We're not going to talk about f orbitals in organic chemistry because again, all we care about are the um, are the outermost uh, orbitals the valent, for the valence shell. Okay, so what is a molecular orbital then? Now, when we take two atoms, we bring them together, those electrons are now gonna be shared between the two atoms to make a molecule. And so the, the electrons are now gonna exist in molecular orbitals rather than atomic orbitals. Okay, and that's when we combine, we combine atomic orbitals to make covalent bonds. If we take two atomic orbitals and we mathematically combine them, the result is gonna give us two new molecular orbitals. So um, what is that? Uh, and, and it comes that way because there's going to be two possible combinations every time we do that, do that mathematical combination. So for example, let's say we want to form a sigma bond between two hydrogen atoms to make a molecule of H2 gas. Okay, so we can imagine hydrogen A and hydrogen B each coming in with one electron. And uh, in the end, those two electrons are going to be uh, in, a, in a region between the two hydrogen nuclei and we describe that as a sigma bond, a sigma bond. And what that really means is you have a sigma, the sigma is the name of the molecular orbital. So if we have, uh, if, if we have the, the atomic orbitals for a hydrogen atom, all we have is an S orbital. So we have our, our S orbital coming together with another S orbital. If those two signs match, if they are the same, then we're gonna have a, a constructive uh, overlap, a constructive uh, a combination of those two orbitals. When, when they are in phase. And so we get a new molecular orbital that looks something like this. That's, that's the shape of a sigma molecular orbital. We describe it as a bonding molecular orbital and that is what's gonna hold those two atoms together is a sigma bond, okay? But if we combine them by, by subtracting one from the other, so if, if one of these was a plus phase and the other one was a minus phase, then, uh, you know, which we have just no shading, then they're gonna have a destructive um, uh, overlap. They're, they're not going to be um, favorable. And so we end up with just two separate, the MO has two separate nodes like this, <laughs> two separate lobes like this, sorry, with a node in between where the, uh, um, the mathematical sign changes. And we describe this as an anti-bonding orbital because if electrons were in this, molecular orbital, they would not do anything to help keep those two atoms together. And so um, this, this lower energy one is described as a sigma MO, and this higher energy one is called a sigma star MO, the anti-bonding. Uh, and, and we're showing this uh, with, with kind of relative energies um, uh, where the sigma star is higher in energy than the sigma. So uh, another way to represent this is if we have one electron coming in one electron coming in from each uh, sigma orbital, sigma atomic orbital. When they combine, again, we have two atomic orbitals coming in. Combining mathematically, we're gonna get two molecular orbitals. As a result, one is gonna be lower in energy than the, the atomic orbitals. One is gonna be higher energy than the atomic orbitals. And, uh, and, and when we, these two electrons combine and they pair up to form a sigma bond, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the lower energy orbital, which is the sigma molecular orbital. So um, the bonding orbital, the bonding orbital contains two electrons. That's what we describe as a sigma bond. So that is a sigma bond means two electrons paired up in a sigma bonding molecular orbital. And the antibonding orbital is usually empty. So the sigma star is there, but it's empty. Okay, so uh, one thing uh, we can note here again is as we increase the number of nodes, that is going to be increasing our energy, right? This has a node, so it is a higher energy. The antibonding is higher energy than this one that has uh, no nodes. The orbital with more nodes is less stable, higher in energy. This is a theme we're going to be seeing down the road when we look uh, more closely at MO theory. We're doing just a smidge of MO theory right here. Hopefully, this is reviewing some material you've seen in general chemistry. Uh, and and uh, again, we'll, we'll come back to this much later in the, in the semester and in, in the course, I should say.
next semester. So what if I wanted to form a pi bond? What does a pi bond look like? Well, that's when we have two p orbitals that are coming together and they form a pi bond. So here are my two atomic orbitals, each uh, uh, carbon, let's say, let's say we're making a carbon-carbon pi bond. The, they each bring in one p orbital. Again, there's two combinations we can have, one where we, the signs match. So we have that constructing bonding uh, uh, interaction. That's called a pi bond. Uh, or, or they can have um, where if we imagine like flipping one of these over so that the signs don't line up, then we we have a, no constructive uh, overlap here or here. And so we now again have two nodes. We have a node vertically where the sign changes. We have a node horizontally where the sign changes. So again, we see increasing the number of nodes increases the energy. So when we form a pi bond, again, we can imagine each uh, p orbital coming in with one electron. And when those two atomic orbitals combine, it makes two molecular orbitals, one that is more stable. We call that the bonding, the pi, and one that's anti-bonding, that's the pi star. So we get the same pattern again. And where are the two electrons going to, where the two electrons are going to go, they're going to pair up in the, uh, in the bonding molecular orbital, the bonding pi molecular orbital. And that's what a pi bond looks like. A pi bond looks like this. It has a cloud of electron density above and below uh, the, the sigma bond, the, the, um, the distance between, the, the space between the two nuclei. All right, so uh, just FYI, an interesting application of this, like why do we care about these pi star and sigma star orbitals if they're always empty, right? Well, why, why do we even care that these anti-bonding orbitals exist? What, what do they do for us? Well, um, knowing that there's this uh, kind of this place that, that electrons can go um, helps explain electronic transitions. When we have excited states of a molecule, what happens is uh, is an, an electron can be promoted to a higher energy orbital. And that's where the, sig, the pi star orbitals especially can uh, come into play. And so this has to do with UV vis spectroscopy and color. Um, the fact that we could see color uh, is because of these, um, of these uh, electronic transitions. Okay, here's the overall energy level of our molecular orbitals. The sigma is the lowest energy. Um, and then the pi comes, and then any non-bonded electrons, non-bonding, meaning lone pairs, those are uh, higher energy still. And then we have our anti-bonding above that. So as, as stabilized as the sigma bond is, sigma molecular orbital, that's how destabilized the sigma star is, and so on. Okay, um, so what happens uh, is when we introduce light energy, typically UV light, um, we can get this electronic trans transmission, uh, the transition up to uh, promoted to a higher energy. Okay, now what's interesting is the gap here between the pi and the pi star orbital, that energy gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller if our pi bonds are conjugated to one another. And I, I'm sorry, in my copy here, I don't know if this happened in my handout as well. Um, when you have alternating pi bonds, so if you have a pi bond, and then a sigma bond, and then a pi bond. So a single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. When you have alternating double bonds, we describe those as being conjugated. And the longer the conjugation, the more and more pi bonds that we have conjugated, that energy gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, as we increase the number of conjugated pi bonds, it increases resonance delocalization, resonance stabilization. We'll talk about that in chapter two and it decreases the energy needed for pi to pi star. And eventually it decreases it so much that you no longer need ultraviolet light. You can actually have visible light causing that transition. That's a, gonna be a lower energy tra uh, um, uh, uh, transition that's possible. So for example, let's look at some colored organic compounds like beta carotene. This is the structure of beta carotene. Where have you heard of that? Where would you, might you find that? Where, where did it get its name, carotene? It's called that because this is the compound that's in carrots that makes them orange. And uh, as you can see, we have this long 
uh, conjugated system, right? Again, alternating double bonds, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. And uh, the transition that uh, the energy that's required to do that pi to pi star transi transition is uh, 454 nanometers, which corresponds to blue light. So if you shine visible light onto a carrot, that that blue light gets absorbed. So what do you? How does the how does the carrot appear to to the eye in uh, visible light? It appears orange. You see the opposite color because that those are the colors that are being reflected. Um, if the blue light's being absorbed, the object appears orange. So that is um, uh, what beta carotene looks like. Lycopene is has a very similar structure now but we see that these rings have opened up over here on both ends. And so that slightly changes the um, energy required to do that transition. So if it's absorbing a slightly different wavelength of light, that means the color appears slightly different. And lycopene, of course, is red. That is the, um, that is the uh, compound that's in tomatoes that gives them their red color. Uh, if you look at the structure of chlorophyll, another organic molecule, that's the, what is uh, present in green plants that allows them to do photosynthesis. Here we see a long cyclic system of conjugated pi bonds. So that would give us a hint that maybe this is a colored compound. And uh, in fact, that is, uh, that's, that's, what we, uh, that's what we get. And there's also artificial colors. Um, so this is red number 40. This has, uh, has again, this, so this is a synthetic molecule, um, but because of that conjugated system, it too is colored. And, and so you could maybe use that um, to do coloring as well. Now, beta carotene, lycopene, these molecules are, are actually, they're um, radical scavengers. So they're very good to have in our diet. So you can, you can uh, you know, go home tonight when you're planning dinner and say, you know what, I think I need to have some pizza because that tomato paste is gonna be very healthy. I wanna increase that lycopene in my diet, that would be a good idea. Um, and so you might think, well, wait a minute, why would we use artificial colors, you know, um, in, in if we want to color something, why wouldn't we just use lycopene to color the, to color the, you know, lollipop or the, or the candy or something like that? Um, why wouldn't we use a natural source, um, especially if it's healthy for us? Well, the problem is these, these natural molecules like beta carotene and lycopene are not stable. They, they will break down they will oxidize. They will they will lose their ability to absorb light, and so so the purpose of making synthetic dyes and synthetic colors is you can um, you know they'll be much much longer living, and and you know when you open up that bag of Skittles uh, a year after it was manufactured, you still have that same rainbow of fruit flavors there with all your bright colors because the, those compounds are are stable. So. Um, you know, the, the things that um, nature provides don't always have the, the best uh, properties for what we might want to use them for. So anyway, again, just a quick little dive into MO theory. We'll see more later. Um, and, and don't, don't uh, you know, be too uh, turned off by it because if it weren't for these pi star uh, uh, orbitals that exist, we would have no color in our life, right? So as you look around, in the room you're in, you know, I'm sure you're seeing all sorts of interesting pi star uh, interactions there that uh, that make it we're us very happy that <laughs> the MO theory uh, can can help explain that. All right, so let's let's think now about carbon. We just talked about some general atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals. Let's focus in on carbon and say, okay, let's let's look at our our simplest organic molecule, methane. Um, how do we how do, how is methane what does the bonding look like in methane? Okay, so let's take a look at carbon's atomic orbitals. How many valence electrons does do, are, are, can we expect in the atomic orbitals of carbon? Our valence electrons, remember, corresponds to the group number. And when we look at our periodic table, we see that it is in group four. So there's four valence electrons. So when we look at the um, electronic configuration in our, in, for carbon in the valence, shell, we would say that in the outermost shell, remember, um, we always want to fill in the lowest energy orbital first. So we would pair up two electrons and put them in the in the s orbital. And then remember, we have like poly exclusion principle and Hund's rule and those things. Remember, we want to um, spread out the electrons. We don't want to pair them up until we have to. And we would have the, uh, so we would we would put those remaining two electrons in two different p orbitals. 
Okay, but if you take a look at that arrangement of electrons in carbon, how many bonds does it look like carbon is able to make? It really only has two electrons that are ready to be shared, let's say with two, uh, two hydrogen atoms, right? So this kind of tells me it would form two bonds. And is that what we expect for carbon? Does carbon typically form two bonds? That is not cool. That is not what we are expecting. We know that carbon likes to form four bonds. So that's pretty easy. All we have to do is if we added in a little energy and we promote an electron, we could actually very easily imagine a carbon atom with four you know, uh, uh, unpaired electrons that are ready for bonding, ready to be shared. Okay, so that is nice because uh, now it can form four bonds, which is what we're expecting. Okay, but here's the next puzzle. Here's the next riddle we have to solve. Methane, methane is completely symmetrical, completely symmetrical. All four CH bonds are identical. Now that doesn't make sense. If we imagine bringing in four hydrogens, for example, we would expect one to bond to, you know, that hydrogen S orbital to bond with the carbon S orbital, and then the three other hydrogens to bond to the PX and the PY and the PZ. We would, we would, there's no way we'd have four identical bonds. So what's going on here? How, do, how is it that, um, that we can get these four bonds that are identical? The answer, of course, is right here in the topic of section 10. Uh, it, it works because of hybridization, a theory, a process that, uh, that helps explain the, the um, uh, observed uh, bond shapes and reactivity and so on. So what does hybridization mean? Hybridization means we're going to mix our atomic orbitals to give new hybrid orbitals, right? If you, if you blend plants, if you crossbreed plants, you get hybrid plants, hybrid fruits, and so on. Hybrid means uh, that you're mixing something. And so this is an S orbital is spherical and a P orbital is dumbbell shaped. And so what do these hybrid orbitals look like? It has uh, two lobes, but one of them is more spherical. One of them is kind of um, uh, larger. So it, it looks uh, something like between an S and a P orbital. This is what our hybrid orbitals look like. And it turns out there's three types of hybridization that can take place. Um, it's uh, every carbon is either gonna be SP or SP2 or SP3 hybridized. And um, it, the type of hybridization that it's going to undergo depends on its bonding situation. So it depends on how many regions of electron density it needs to accommodate about the carbon atom. So let's let's take a look at that and see how we can determine these regions of electron density. Okay, so let's take a look at three sample organic molecules. Okay, um, in, each, in this case, this is a two carbon molecule, but let's just look at one of the two carbons and, and describe its, its bonding and, and therefore its hybridization. So this carbon atom, how many regions of electron density does it have? Well, it has four single bonds around it, four sigma bonds. So it simply has four regions of electron density. And for that type of carbon, that situation, the hybridization we're gonna describe as sp3. Okay, so why do we call it sp3 hybridized? Because what we're doing is we are mixing the s orbital, the atomic s orbital, and all three p orbitals, we're mixing them all together to form these new hybrid orbitals called sp3s. So if you if you start with four atomic orbitals and you hybridize them, you're still gonna have four atomic orbitals, but now they're going to be four hybrid orbitals called sp3s. So four sp3 hybrid orbitals. And what do they look like? They all kind of look like that shape, that shape, remember what a hybrid orbital look like, looks like, it's, it's uh, it's got one large lobe and one tiny little back lobe. Okay, and what kind of geometry? The part, of, part of hybridization, the nice thing about it is it helps us predict geometry. We could just use uh, VSCPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, saying that, hey, bonds represent electrons, you know, and electrons want to be as far apart from each other as possible. So if you have four groups of electrons and you want to spread them out as far apart as possible, what, what uh, uh, arrangement can you have? What geometry does that dictate? That will be tetrahedral. So we're gonna get tetrahedral um, 
bond angles, which a uh, uh, tetrahedral arrangement of electrons, which gives us bond angles of 109.5. 109.5. All right, how about the next one? Now, if this, car this carbon still has four bonds, right? Like every neutral carbon atom has four bonds, but, the but they're arranged differently because we have a double bond and then we have two single bonds. So this carbon now only has three regions of electron density. And in cases like that, the hybridization that is undergone is described as sp2. And we call it sp2 hybridization because it mixes the s orbital with only two of the p orbitals that are on carbon, which means one of the p orbitals is still there. It hasn't undergone hybridization. It still has that classic dumbbell shape of, the, of a regular p orbital. So what is the result? When, when, I, when we think about this hybridization, we're now going to have three sp2 orbitals. Those are our hybrid orbitals. plus we're going to have one p orbital. So one p orbital stays uh, unhybridized, and we have three new hybrid orbitals. Now, if you have three regions of electron density, again, back to valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, three regions, how do you spread them out as much as possible? We put them in the corners of a triangle. We put them in the corners of a triangle. So this is going to be trigonal planar. I'm still talking to the camera. I have no idea if you guys can see me or not. So, sorry, I can't help it. So this is gonna be trigonal planar, the bond angle. Bond angle, if these, if, uh, if when we compare, you know, um, the, the, these three bond angles, it's gonna be 120 degrees. Okay, and do you see a pattern emerging here? Do you see a pattern? So when I look at the uh, a carbon now, this carbon, for example, it has, has a triple bond and a single bond. So this now only has two regions of electron density. So what do you think its hybridization is gonna be called? It's gonna be called SP hybridized. And why is it called that? Because you mix an S and a P, which means now two of the P orbitals uh, have remained unchanged. So what's the result? Every time you have an SP hybridized carbon, it's always the same. You have two SP orbitals and you have two p orbitals. Every sp hybridized atom looks the same, uh, or yeah, carbon atom especially. And uh, two regions of electrons. How do you how do you spread them out as much as possible? You simply have a linear arrangement. You just put them 180 degrees from each other, and that will get them as far apart from each other as possible. So 180 degrees is the bond angle that we expect here. We expect that to, to be 180 degrees. Maybe we can add that in here. So this bond angle will be 109.5. This bond angle will be 120. And this bond angle will be 180. So I've kind of drawn them with uh, with the approximately uh, representative geometry there. All right. So. What are we going to do with the hybridization once we uh, uh, are able to uh, predict it? We're going to use that to determine the three-dimensional shape, the 3D structures. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that next. But let's let's just do a couple exercises here. Um, how about uh, if if I'm given a molecule here? How about if I need to assign the hybridizations for a given molecule? Let's just look at every atom now. Remember what what does uh, hybridization mean? It is something that belongs to an atom. A molecule doesn't have a hybridization. Each atom in the molecule can undergo hybridization. So the first thing we need to do is we need to complete the Lewis structure. We need to complete the Lewis structure. So uh, we talked about how to do that. Make sure everyone's got a, a filled octet. And um, so what do you think here? Any, any lone pair? We, we've shown all the sigma and pi bonds. So the only thing that might be missing are lone pairs. So where do we have lone pairs? If there were any formal charges, I would have to show them. So every one of these atoms are neutral. So that tells me I need to go in and, and fill the octets to make sure every atom is neutral. Remember what our, our typical bonding patterns look like. So a neutral oxygen, what does a neutral oxygen look like? Two bonds and two lone pairs. That gives me a filled octet and it gives me the right electron count. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
oxygen has six in it once, six. So that's perfect. Okay, where else do we miss? Are we missing lone pairs? That nitrogen, the typical bonding pattern for nitrogen would be three bonds and a lone pair. Now it has a filled octet. And again, it's a neutral nitrogen atom, one, two, three, four, five. If you're not sure about how I just did that formal charge math, you can go back to the Lewis structure video and review that. Okay, so first thing I'm going to uh, complete the Lewis structure. The next thing is that hybridization is for each atom, for each atom. So we're gonna look at the nitrogen and each carbon atom. And we can also look at the oxygen. So hybridization is for, for, for a given atom. Hydrogen atoms can't undergo hybridization because the, a hydrogen atom only has one, uh, the one S orbital is the only atomic orbital it has. So there's no mixing that can happen. There's no nothing to hybridize. So every hydrogen comes in is always just an S orbital and but all the other atoms uh, can, can undergo hybridization. So then all we need to do for each of these is we need to count the regions on each atom to decide how many regions it is and therefore which which uh, category does it fit in? Okay, and what does a region mean? A region of electron density might be a lone pair, it might be a single bond or a double bond or a triple bond. So how many you know groups of electrons are spaced around this around this atom? Okay, so for example, for example, when we look at this nitrogen atom, it has two regions. It has the lone pair and the triple bond, right? Two regions. And so when you have two regions, is that sp2? Is that sp2? No, that's sp. That's sp. You have one s and one p, and that adds up to two. So this, so this nitrogen is sp hybridized. Okay, how about this carbon atom? Same thing, it has a triple bond and a single bond. So when you have just two regions, it's also going to be sp hybridized. SP hybridized. The next carbon over has one, two, three regions around it. So three regions means SP2. Okay, and again, you can kind of like mentally just adding up the the um, the subscript the superscripts, right? So there's one S and two P's. That's how we get the three hybrid orbitals. We mixed, mixed one S and two P's. Okay, that top oxygen, that top oxygen has one, two, three, or what do you think? Should we count the two lone pairs together? Or do you think they wanna be as far apart from each other as possible? That sounds about right. Yeah, so each lone pair is its own region of electron density. So this oxygen is also sp2. And then finally, the carbon atom, the, car the last carbon atom has now four single bonds, four regions. So is that sp4? That sp4, there's no such thing as sp4. There's no such thing as sp4. It is sp3, one s and three p's gives me a total of four hybrid orbitals. Okay, so this isn't something, some magical thing that we're memorizing, right? There should be some logic on how we associate the regions of electron density with the hybridization. Okay, and what we'll talk about next is we'll talk about then how do we take that hybridization and start to build a 3D sketch of a molecule. Okay, one other thing that we can do, we can um, uh, use hybridization to describe is these hybrid orbitals are what, what's gonna come together to form bonds, to form bonds. So, um, so for example, how do I make this, this CH bond and what type of bond is it? So we have two questions here. What is, what is the type of bond and which orbitals overlap to form the bond, to form each of the indicated bonds? So um, the type of bond we have, it could be a sigma or a pi bond, right? All covalent bonds are described as sigma or pi bonds. So the, the first bond connecting two atoms is always described as the sigma bond. So any single bond must be a sigma bond. And what orbitals are being used to uh, create that? The hydrogen atom brings the S orbital. It's S orbital, that's all it has. And what hybrid orbital does the carbon have? Well, it depends on its hybridization. This carbon is sp hybridized, is sp hybridized. So it's the hybrid orbital that it's using to form 
this CH bond, this CH bond. Okay, now how about a triple bond? How would you describe a triple bond? How many pi bonds, how many sigma bonds do we have there? Remember, there's always the electron density directly between the two nuclei. That's always described as the sigma bond. So you can never have more than one sigma bond. So there's always one sigma bond. Any additional bond is described as a pi bond. So this has one sigma and two pi's. So the way you form the sigma bonds is with the hybrid orbitals. So there's an sp coming from one carbon overlapping with the sp hybrid orbital coming from the other. And then the, the pi bond is uh, formed by using a p orbital. So uh, you can imagine that we have two p orbitals that, that are both on the uh, y axis, right? So we could have a py and a py. And then the other pair of orbitals, p orbitals, can be the z axis. So one set of p orbitals is, uh, is, is uh, perpendicular to this like this, that's one pi bond. And then the other pi bond is sticking out and back, sticking out on the, on the Z axis. So we could use this to describe um, uh, any, any bond, any uh, sigma or pi bond. Uh, on the last page here, I have some, some pictures that can help uh, visualize this. And we'll look at some models next time when we look at 3D uh, shapes of molecules. So this is this is our tetrahedral shape of an S of an sp3 hybridized atom. Each of these four hybrid orbitals is described as an sp3 an sp3 hybrid orbital. Okay, we'll talk about how to draw these using uh, line drawings and using wedges and dashes to represent um, bonds that are either sticking out towards you or pointing away from you. Every sp2 hybridized atom has three sp2 hybrid orbitals that are trigonal planar, plus a p orbital, plus one p orbital that did not undergo hybridization. And those two are gonna be orthogonal to each other, perpendicular to each other. So if we draw the sp2s in the plane like this, then the p orbital is gonna be in the z axis, sticking straight out and straight back. Or if we kind of draw it on its side like this, this wedge bond means it's pointing out at you. This dash bond means it's behind the page, like it'd be invisible if the page was opaque, if the screen was opaque. So if we draw this so that it's uh, perpendicular to the screen, then we could draw the p orbital in the, in the screen. Okay, and an sp hybridized, has two hybrid orbitals that are linear, that are 180 to each other, plus it has two p orbitals that haven't been hybridized. So it starts getting a little messy. <laughs> it start, sp hybridized atoms are kind of hard to draw. So again, here's our py uh, uh, orbital, and here's our pz orbital. And if we just and, and we use those those uh, hybrid orbitals typically to to form our sigma bonds. So if we draw those just as straight lines, here we see our 180, our 180 bond angle. Okay, and then we're gonna what we're gonna look at next time is we're gonna look at some bonding. So we'll we'll come back to this uh, and we'll look at some models, and then we'll draw them. Uh, we'll we'll learn how to draw them next time. All right, but this is a good stopping point looking at our hybridization, hybridization of carbon atoms based on the number of electron uh, regions around that atom. All right, that's good for now. See you later.